Thank you. So what's more important? Trying to solve a trillion dollar problem affecting healthcare using data and exponentially advancing technologies, or using those same advances in order to save a single person's life? Well, a year ago on this same stage, pretty well to the day, um, I talked about how I was inspired to try and solve a trillion dollar problem. Uh, one that affects us all and affects our economies, the, the crushingly huge problem of complex chronic disease, and how we can use exponentially advancing data technologies to try and reduce, for instance, um, all preventable hospitalizations in the chronically ill. Using things like big data, which we're starting to amass from all of its silos, using the advances we're seeing in machine intelligence, and using the, the real revolution that we're seeing uh, in devices and the ability to do things which previously we could only do in labs, and now we can do at home. And I also introduced my vision of how one day we would all be able to benefit a bit like this gentleman, Darth Vader, <laughs> and how with all of his many chronic physical and mental issues, <laughs> with the benefit of data and technology, he was able to do his day job and enjoy life to the full. But this year, I'm not going to talk about the future. I'm going to talk about the recent past, about this lady who's now 39 years old, who I've known for about 20 years, a very good friend, who sadly had some bad news. A few years before, this is what, about three years ago now, uh, she'd been trying for ages to have kids, and they found out that it wasn't her husband's technique nor his swimmers. And so they sent her to a specialist. And the specialist um, decided to do some structural scans. And so she had an MRI scan, amongst other things. And basically, it was normal. Radiologists said it was OK. Uh, and there was some, another doctor who said, well, in the muscle, there are some of these weird spots. And they look like tuberculosis of the womb. Oh, I've never heard of tuberculosis in the womb, such, such a person for about 100 years. But um, so it got me thinking, how come? There is such a variety of opinion here when we've got hundreds of thousands of scans and the technology, for instance, in deep learning can analyze such things and give us answers based on real facts and outcomes from scans like this. And it, it, was, a, it was a surprise to me. Three years later, and we have an, so many research projects and companies working on stuff like this. There's a company on the startup stage that I've been helping that is doing full body MRI scanning for a tenth of the normal price of a medical MRI and can track subtle changes in your body without the need of a radiologist or any medics to do so. There are companies like Zebra in Israel looking at nine million scans and deriving data uh, and being able to support decisions um, way beyond what radiologists can do. And just in four weeks, in a little project I've got in the, in the United States on 4,000 chest CT scans, our software is able to get better than the best radiologist at saying whether something is a tumour in the lung or not. 15% better than the best radiologist. How come we haven't had that before? Anyway, back to Marge. That's her name. Um, she went back to the specialist and the specialist said, you know, looks okay, basically structurally, but I've got this niggling thing. I just... I think I'm going to do an exploratory operation, just to look inside the womb and to look you know, around the ovaries and inside the abdomen. Um, and I don't know why I'm doing it, and I'm probably getting in trouble for doing so, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and indeed, he got in trouble for doing it, but the results came back. And actually, what surprised me is that his hunch about what was going on was never something that was captured or analyzed or able to be interrogated from the electronic medical record. Something, again, that some projects are trying to address today. The, the news that Marge got was this. The reason you can't have kids, the reason you can never have a family, is because you have cancer throughout the entirety of the lining of your womb. You also have cancer in your ovary. We don't know what's spread from where, but you'll need an immediate operation. You'll lose your fertility, and you'll be put into menopause, and the prognosis is poor. So she phoned me up as a friend and said, look, is there anything else I should be looking at? So I got out a piece of exponentially advancing technology from my pocket, my smartphone. 
Remarkably, within a week, we had half a dozen opinions from professors from all different parts of the globe. It took longer to get a second opinion from her same hospital, surprisingly. And she was given some options. One of the options came from a peculiar source. It didn't come from a medic, it came from a mathematician who was able to sit down with her and describe the statistics of if she did wait a little bit, if she did actually try to maybe get harvest some eggs from her, one of her ovaries, would she actually go from one stage of the cancer to the next? She made her decisions based on logic, based on reason, based on data. And so she negotiated with her surgeon. She went to an IVF clinic that she sourced online from data, and the very, very best results um, available, data that wouldn't be available without the internet, made a wise decision. On a Christmas Eve, 2011, she went through a cycle of IVF, a blind cycle of IVF, managed to get 10 eggs out, fertilized six of them, and she stored them on ice. IVF has also come a long way. That very same clinic this year has introduced analytics based on high-speed photography to see how the cells divide to, for identifying which of those eggs is going to survive best. And also incredible things like being able to take just from a, 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 an embryo a few days old, taking one cell out and doing full genome sequencing on it in order to find out whether or not there are any abnormalities. So she had her operation. Her operation was remarkable. She lost five mils of blood. I've lost more blood in a nosebleed. It's quite extraordinary where we've come with surgery, but of course it's not accelerating at the same pace as data. And they came back with even more news. So not only had this uh, tumour been removed and, 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 and sliced and looked at by the, uh, by the histologists, but also um, some genetics had been done. The initial, the initial answer was that she needed an even bigger operation. The cancer was very much related, probably spread. She, she needed to remove all of her lymph nodes. Um, the prognosis was even poorer. But thank God they sent it off for some further genetics. And we got, helped her get a, um, a second opinion on the histology. And after some deeper investigation, it turns out that they were two separate synchronous primary tumours, stage one. It hadn't spread. This was a completely different scenario altogether. And had they removed everything before, she would have been infertile and left without a family. So a year after that, she found a surrogate who very kindly carried her child. And the end result of a very, very long struggle is this. This baby was born a year ago, pretty well to the day. I remember that day quite well because just after I gave my talk about how to try and solve trillion dollar problems using data and exponential advances in technology, I got this text message from Marge. Basically, where the hell are you? I'm at Wired Health. <laughs> Anything serious, your daughter's about to be born. So my apologies, I didn't tell you that actually Marjorie is my wife and Sienna is my baby daughter. And just to thank, very quickly, just to thank them for their bravery and for letting me use their story, I'd just like to bring them on stage. Say hello, Wired. Hello, Wired. <laughs> hello, Wired. Yeah. Aww. So, living proof that with the right kind of information and with the intelligence to be able to use it, it can really transform individual people's lives. Thank you very, very much. So William Gibson said that famous phrase that um, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. 
And Marjorie is a living example, really, of things that are available and accessible, but sadly, not all of us have got access to it yet. Um, a lot of us here in the audience are pioneers of very rapidly moving spaces and very rapidly advancing technologies. I think it's our responsibility not only to think about how to build billion dollar companies from marvelous new technologies, but also to think very seriously about how we implement that into healthcare, how we get these technologies into the hands of doctors, into the lives of patients, so that we don't simply just talk here on stage about the marvelous things we're doing, which is going to help us all in 10 years' time, but how it's going to help individuals to right here today. Thank you.